All right. I'm going to cut to the chase. Dr. Craig has only two sources of historical evidence in reality, the epistles and the gospels. Point blank, my argument is the gospels have no relevant value as historical sources, and the epistles don't tell us anything we can prove was unnatural. First up, the gospels record myth, not history. I wanted to, de I wanted to debate that subject with Dr. Craig today, but he didn't want to, so now I can only give you some examples proving my point so I can leave room to discuss the many other topics in this debate. Uh, but I can assure you, if I had more time, these examples could be multiplied a dozen times over. One of the clearest examples of myth-making in the Gospels is the Barabbas narrative. According to Mark, the Romans occupying Judea had a custom of releasing a prisoner every year on the Jewish holiday, whoever the Jews voted for. So Pilate asks the Jews if they want him to release Jesus Christ. And instead, the chief priests convince everyone to ask for Barabbas instead, a convicted murderer who had rebelled against Rome. Now, there is no evidence the Romans ever had such a custom of releasing just any prisoner the Jews wanted. Nor is it all, at all plausible the Romans certainly would not let loose a murderer and a traitor, least of all because the very people who rebelled asked them to. But Mark's story clearly copies an actual ritual, ritual the Jews performed at their temple every year at Yom Kippur. Two goats would be selected. One would be chosen to be the scapegoat, and all the sins of Israel would be placed upon it, and it would be released into the wild to be claimed by the devil, while the other goat would be sacrificed and its blood would atone for the sins of all Israel. Now, as it happens, Barabbas is a fake name. In Aramaic, it means son of the father. So here we have two sons of the father, Barabbas and Jesus, one who carries the sins of Israel, murder and rebellion, and is released to the mob, and the other whose blood atones for the sins of all Israel. So here we have a historically unbelievable story involving a man with a fake name that nevertheless carries deep symbolic meaning. By definition, that's a myth. This story has been constructed by the author for its symbolism. It's not a historical report of anything that actually happened. Now, there are many more examples like this surveyed in the works of biblical scholars like Randall Helms and Thomas Brody and Burton Mack and Jonathan Reed and Helmut Coaster and many more. As scholars have long known, all the Gospels are filled to the brim with stories deliberately constructed for their symbolic and literary meaning rather than their historical verity. For example, one indicator of myth is the inclusion of implausibly convenient story structure, what literary scholars call deliberate irony. Mark, for example, has Jesus constantly talking about the reversal of expectation as the message of the gospel, teaching with many parables that the least shall be first, the high will be brought low, the meek shall inherit the earth, the poor shall be rich, and so on. So it's a rather implausible coincidence when the actual narrative of Mark's story is filled with remarkably convenient reversals of expectation. James and John, who ask to sit at the right and left of Jesus in his glory, are replaced by two thieves on his right and left at his crucifixion. Simon Peter, Christ's right-hand man, who was told he had to deny himself and take up his cross and follow, denies Christ instead and is replaced by a different Simon, Simon of Cyrene, a stranger who actually, actually takes up his cross and follows. Likewise, contrary to expectation, Christ's own people, the Jews, mock their own savior while it is a Gentile officer of Rome who recognizes his divinity. And the male disciples abandon Jesus, while the women truly follow him and are thus the first to learn of his resurrection, proving again that the least shall be first, and on and on. Countless elements of Mark's story involve deliberately fabricated irony like this. Another indicator of myth is the construction of stories, even down to the specific details, using material from the Old Testament. It's well known, for example, that Mark constructs his crucifixion narrative using material from Psalm 22, the casting of lots for his clothes, Jesus' cry on the cross, the taunts of the crowd, all come from that psalm, often verbatim. But as I show in the empty tomb, Mark also constructed his empty tomb narrative using material from Genesis, Ecclesiastes, Chronicles, and Psalm 24 in a similar way. Another indicator of myth is the inclusion of deliberate parallels and inversions of other myths. For example, Luke tells the story of a man named Cleopas who journeys on the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus after the corpse of Jesus has vanished when the resurrected Jesus appears to him and explains the secrets of the kingdom. Then he vanishes, and Cleopas goes on to proclaim what he was told. As it happens, the name Cleopas conveniently means tell all. In other words, proclaim. Moreover, this tale exactly emulates and in deliberate ways inverts a story already celebrated every year in Rome, and in that other story, a man named Proculus, whose name also means proclaim, journeys on the road from Alba Longa to Rome after the corpse of Romulus has vanished, 
And just like Jesus, the resurrected Romulus appears and explains the secrets of empire. Then he vanishes, and Proculus goes on to proclaim what he was told. In both stories, the men are journeying from east to west, toward the sea, along the path of the sun, from a city on a mountain to a city in a valley, and in both stories, the distance of the road is exactly the same, 14 miles. This, these similarities are too numerous to be a coincidence. Again, this is deliberate symbolic fiction. And like many myths, the way the story is changed is the whole point. The similarities tell us what story to compare it to, while the differences tell us what the author wants us to learn from that comparison. Romulus told Proculus that if the Romans are virtuous, they will conquer the world. But Jesus told Cleopas that the virtuous will join a spiritual kingdom instead of a physical one. Romulus appeared in immense glory, as befit his message of glory, but Jesus appeared in humble disguise, as befit his message of humility. And while Proculus receives his gospel on the road to Rome, Cleopas receives his gospel on the road from Jerusalem. So while the old story implies all roads lead to Rome, the new story implies all roads lead from Jerusalem. In almost every detail, the stories are identical or exactly the reverse. Another indicator of myth is the reification of imaginary people into real people. In the Gospel of John, for example, a new character is invented, Lazarus, whom Jesus raises from the dead, an amazing event none of the other Gospels apparently had ever heard of, suddenly appears in John. In John chapter 11, this Lazarus is identified as the one whom Jesus loved, who is later cited as a witness for the details of the crucifixion and resurrection, again appearing in those narratives exactly where none of the other Gospels ever imagined him before. And yet we know this Lazarus didn't exist, for he first appears in Luke's Gospel as a fictional person in a parable, where Jesus tells a story about a rich man burning in hell who sees a dead beggar named Lazarus in heaven. So he begs God to raise this Lazarus from the dead so he can warn his living brothers to avoid his own hellish fate. The parable ends with God refusing, telling him, if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. Notice what happens in John. He reverses the message of Luke's parable by having Jesus actually raise Lazarus from the dead, which convinces many people to turn and be saved. The very thing Luke's Jesus said wouldn't work. In fact, just as the rejected request in Luke's parable imagined Lazarus going to people and convincing them, John's Lazarus is then cited as a witness to the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus specifically to convince people. Again, what Luke's Jesus said wouldn't work. John has thus reified a fictional character and integrated him into the story where he never was before in order to argue against the particular message in Luke, seeking instead to persuade people with the very outcome Luke said wouldn't persuade them. Another indicator of myth is the acceptance of wildly contradictory versions of the same myth. For example, Matthew's gospel wildly contradicts Mark's empty tomb narrative in almost every detail, elaborating it with incredible claims of posted guards and flying superhuman angels magically paralyzing people and hurling about tombstones. Again, in the empty tomb, I demonstrate where all these crazy changes came from. Matthew completely rewrote the empty tomb story in Mark in order to portray Jesus as a new Daniel in the lion's den borrowing exact words, phrases, and details from the book of Daniel in order to construct this new story. Okay, I've only given you a few examples, but all the Gospels are full of mythical narratives like this, cover to cover, where stories are constructed symbolically, mining the Jewish scriptures and pagan myths for symbolic details. Histories are not written this way. These are myths, the telling of implausible tales that never happened, but are constructed with symbolic meaning. The Gospels routinely invent even very public events that never happened. Mark invents a darkness covering the whole world for three hours that no one else saw. Matthew invents a rock-splitting earthquake no one else noticed, as well as a horde of resurrected corpses parading into Jerusalem, leaving hundreds of empty tombs behind, which again no other author had ever seen or heard of, and on and on. As with these events, and Barabbas, and the guards at the tomb, and so on, the, gospels, the gospel authors routinely made up entire people and events, simply to communicate their message through symbols, metaphors, and parables. That means we can't trust anything they say is historical, since we know for a fact from these very examples and many others that they were writing symbolic fiction. We have no reason, therefore, to believe their empty tomb narratives or their appearance narratives were anything more than symbolic fiction as well. Even if some history is lost in there somewhere, having no other sources, we have no way of knowing which details are historical and which made up. And therefore, no evidence in the Gospels can be used to argue for the resurrection of Jesus.